Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this uh, session on TAVI, uh, sponsored by Boston Scientific, entitled Selecting the Right Valve to Secure Lifetime Management. Um, my name is Darren Mylert. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Galway. Uh, I've got a cracking faculty with me. Helga Malaman, Andreas Ruck, who's provided us with a great live case for this, Joanna Workikowska, um, and Giuseppe Tarantini. Um, our objectives for this session um, are to understand the impact of age, life expectancy, and risk factor profile on TAVI choice, the index TAVI, to discuss to master um, future coronary access after TAVI, because we understand increasingly as we treat younger and lower risk patients how important this topic is. And finally, to try and give you a sense for um, the impact of valve choice um, on potential TAV and TAV in the future. There are certain valves that we believe may be optimal for revalving in due course, and certain valves that potentially are less, uh, are, are less um, uh, uh, ideal for this purpose. So without further ado, we're going to kick off um, with a, a, a lecture from Giuseppe. Um, but first, Helga, you're going to tell us, how do, we, how do we interact? Yeah, that's, I think, the most important point. Thank you very much, um, Darren. You are the most important persons here in the room, and the session is made for you. Therefore, I hope you have enough questions for each of our um, discussions and um, uh, lecture. So if you have any question, please step up, come to the microphone or use the app and, and then we get um, the questions here on the screen and can try to answer this question um, after that. So again, um, please um, interact as much as possible. Um, this brings the session forward. But now we are ready to go with Thank Giuseppe. You. Thank you. Dear colleagues, actually, <clears throat> as you can see, my title is the impact of valve choice on procedural outcome and future treatment option. This is my disclosure slide. So actually, this is my storyboard because we have seven to eight minutes for this lecture. Uh, and I will touch upon three different things, outcomes, coronary focus, and THV in THV. Let's get started with the outcomes. And there is no doubt that the introduction of the new platform, Accurate Neo2, is a major step forward compared to the previous technology. Because actually, here you can see, and this is the analysis, restricted to intermediate to low-risk patients. Mortality, stroke rate, and major vascular complication are lower compared to the previous iteration of the Accurate, and actually pretty much compared comparable to the two global leaders. And this is also true when you look at the pacemaker rate, moderate leakage, and the mean gradient. So actually, we're not supposed to make you know, a definitive comparison because this is not a head-to-head -head comparison. But actually, we like to do this comparison because the number counts. and. It, it, at least here for the iteration of the accurate, all the numbers go in the right direction. Look, look here, for instance, at the, at the moderate leakage. Few, uh, coronary focus, I think this is a very important topic. We published recently, a few weeks ago, this consensus document of the APCI dealing with coronary artery disease and TAVI. And actually, just to simplify this, there is this strong recommendation that if P PCI is planning, is planned after TAVI, but actually when you have to deal with coronary, there is this chance because the patient is younger. Actually, the THV choice is very important and also the implantation technique because everything should be aimed to preserve easy coronary access. So let's try to review all the different points that matter in this regard. First of all is cell area. As you can see here, the accurate NEO, even though it's a tall valve, actually you have an easy coronary access with a cell that is two centimeter, two centimeter, compared to the other valve. Secondly, wrist plane and curtain. The wrist plane, even though on the bench might be high, high like, like Likewise, the one of Corvallo Portugal, but actually the recommended implantation depth is about six to seven. And at the end, the functional, let's say, wrist plane is going to be 18 against 23. And when we look at the curtain, the width of the curtain is a half the one of the Corval. So all these elements, engineeristic element, counts a lot. So what about, you know, the choice of the valve? For sure, we know that the benchmark in this regard is to have surgical valve or, let's say, short valve because you stay below with the wrist plane, below 
the coronary artery. But actually, with a supranular valve, you might you might have some kind of impairments. But actually, you can increase, improve this impairment, moving from you know the non-aligned to the oriented version of the valve, up to more than 70% of coronary selective. Eh? This is a direct coronary cannulation, selective coronary cannulation. But actually, again, there is some differences. This is the reaccess study <clears throat> from Barbanti. And so when we make a comparison, even though this is not powered for that, actually the number counts, unsuccessful coronary cannulation is close to zero for accurate. This is pretty much consistent with our consistency, at least half the rate of unsuccessful coronary cannulation with core valve. And finally, this is the cavity registry. This is almost completed. This is an Italian on register of 650 patients compared the three different technology head to head. And actually, even though we miss 100 patients to complete this registry, look at the number again, the accurate NEO2 seems to be favorable compared to the other self-expandable value in terms of coronary cannulation. My last uh, two slides are related to the THV and THV. Actually, we have different permutations. When we start, let's pretend to start with Sabian. Actually, what is the second valve? When we go with self-expandable valve, if we choose to go with accurate, orientated accurate, as you can see, we have two centimeter width to engage with the cutter. This is a bench demonstration and to go into the left coronary artery. And finally, this is the last, and for me, one of the most important concepts. So when we talk about VTA, we have surrogated this measure from the surgical valve to the THV, but this is not exactly possible to do a copy and paste. And I'll show you why. This is the restriction of the movement, of the leafless movement of the accurate NEO. If we measure the distance from the struts to the ascending aorta, that is what we do with the surgical valve, actually we underestimate the room that we have to cannulate the coronary artery. So to be a little bit simpler, we don't have to measure this short measure, but we need to take this other measure. And actually, if we go with a tube inside it, 21 tube inside a 23 accurate. Depending on the width of ascending aorta, we have an extra space outward of, uh, outside of the leaflets that might be from 1 to 2.5 millimeters. In conclusion, this is a real case that we did in my institution. In this iteration, as you can see, when the accurate is oriented, you can go with selective cannulation, zero gradient. And actually, in the, you know, down right of these slides, you can see that the movement of the leaflets is restricted. So actually, you don't need to go into the coronary from outside of the frame, but you can keep going into the coronary artery between the leaflets and the frame of the valve. Thank you for your attention. Giuseppe, thank you. So we have, have actually a minute before we move on to the case presentation. So what, what you're telling us is um, that it seems to you that the accurate NEO2 gives us um, uh, a better index result in terms of low gradient, low pacemaker, and then planning for the future, we get good coronary access and TAV and TAV is possible. First of all, tell me, what's the difference between the NEO and the NEO2 that has given us this better outcome that we see with the NEO2? Actually, there is a modification of the skirt that is very important in actual NEO2. And, uh, you know, also everything is better. Also, the way you deliver the valve actually is improved. So there is a major step forward, I think, in this regard. Okay. Um, Helga, you have any questions there from, from the audience? Yeah, actually we have um, Dr. El Kumi is asking a question. Do you think that the expected valve um, for shortening after <laughs> deployment might affect the presented numbers of valve and skirt height? Percentage of valve? Um, the foreshortening of the valve, whether yes. this will affect um, the um, presented numbers um, of the valve height and the skirt height? Or are these numbers um, actually already the deployed state? But actually, I don't see so much for shortening, to, yeah. be, to be honest. Mm. So actually, you might see for shortening, depending on severe or calcification with the sapien, uh, with other valve. But actually, it's not for me a common finding. I don't know for you, Darren. But actually, uh -huh. this is not a major issue. The, the most important thing with accurate is where you start opening the knob number one. So you need to stay in the right positioning. Sometimes you have to predilate when you have a severe calcification because the only things to avoid is to leave the valve constrained before 
getting the noscon out of the aorta. But I think we can mm. get back to this yeah. concept later. Yeah, I, I think there is something that that's maybe not well understood amongst the community is that with many self-expanding valves, we're trying to get that valve higher. Evolute. Yes. Um, uh, portico, we're trying to get that valve higher to reduce the risk of, of, of um, permanent pacemaker. With the Accurate Neo, at a 7 to 5 millimeter implant, you get single digit pacemaker. The maximum force of this valve is actually at 7 to 5 depth. So if you put this valve higher than, than, than the, the nominal implant, you get less radial force, you will get more PVL and more problems. And so it's a straightforward, simple, relatively deep implant with single digit pacemaker and that leaves you access to the coronaries to the future. Uh, Andreas, why don't you, uh, you take us through the, the live case that you guys performed uh, and let's have a look at that patient. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll present the patient and I'll talk a little bit also about the principles behind the commercial uh, alignment which we'll use then in the case that you'll see in the recording. So if I can have my slides up please. is not it. Okay. Andreas, you can move forward with those. Yes. Um, so the patient um, is not unusual. It's a 83-year-old male with aortic stenosis, uh, in this case actually a low flow, low gradient, despite a normal EF, but with a low cardiac output. Uh, you'll see the CT details later, but this aortic valve calcium score is rather high, over 2,600. So based on that, uh, clearly a severe aortic stenosis. There is some coronary stenosis. Uh, we can debate later, but uh, here in the absence of symptoms, we didn't treat uh, the osteal LCX stenosis with a PCI. I think that's the same as is argued for in the publication by, by, by uh, my colleague here, also in the consensus document. The kidney dis there is some kidney disease, moderate dysfunction in the kidneys, and we have NDT pro BMP elevation. So a quite common patient, I would say with the uh, most uh, common seen symptom grade, also near class 3. This is the details on the analyst, on the CT. We can debate a little bit about the cuspidity of this. Uh, sometimes we talk about cusp asymmetry, meaning if the three cusps of the aortic valve are approximately 120 degrees each, which they seem to be. On the other hand, there seems to be a fusion, which you see in the lower image, uh, between the left and the non-cusps. And the analyst is 25.4 and uh, quite the usual size for a Nordic male, I would say. He's rather big too, with a body surface area of two square meters. Talking a little bit of the opening area, I think uh, it's important to consider before you do the procedure that you reach an adequate opening area. So if you calculate it backwards, what you need uh, here, you need 1.7 to avoid moderate PPM uh, and 1.3 to avoid severe. Uh, and uh, it goes without saying that with uh, this valve, uh, you usually reach a really low gradients and a uh, big opening area. Looking more closely on the CT, you, uh, to the left we have the uh, normal uh, uh, quantification, uh, which was 2,600, as I said. And then for the accurate, the thing that actually matters for the um, uh, ceiling has been shown, at least with the previous generation, is the amount of calcium in the so-called landing zone, which is a thin slice of about 5 millimeters at the analyst level. And there we just see a small dot of calcium, so it seems favorable. Uh, to predict a good result in this patient, we would say, despite the bicuspid anatomy, we don't see a long rough. Uh, uh, it's not an official indication for this valve, I should say, but uh, at least in our practice, we think this is a good valve for this patient, the accurate NEO2. Then coming to the commercial alignment, which we will use in the case you will see, just to introduce it briefly, the idea is that, of course, you have two coronaries, but you have three uh, stent posts in the valve. Uh, and, and then if we look uh, in the right-hand image first, the so-called cusp overlap view, which is typically from the REO, you will see that the, both coronaries will typically overlap in the inner curve of the aorta. 
when we overlap the nadirs of the right and left cusps there too. And then we have on the left side of the right image, we have the yellow dot, which represents a non-coronary cusp. So that means in simple terms, you want to have one stent post between the right and left corner. That means on that side of the picture, and then you want to have two, two stent posts in that picture and go pointing towards the non-coronary side. We can come to the next picture. Uh, it turns out that on this valve, we have the maximum numbers of uh, visible markers on fluoroscopy on any valve on, on the market. You have three markers on two levels. Uh, marked in red are the stent posts. You will see those. Uh, but not only that, uh, about one centimeter lower, you have the so-called free stent strut wing or free cell. That's a small part of the stent that is protruding uh, when uh, the valve is not yet opened up, when it's still uh, in the capsule or in the catheter. And these two, obviously the post and the wing, are straight uh, above each other. So we have a six in total to look at, which uh, helps you with the precise alignment. Now, there is one thing to know, and that is, uh, I marked here in green, the zero, which means zero degrees misalignment. That is a perfect alignment. And then if you look at the 60 marked in red, uh, on the right hand side, you see that the three cast view looks identical. That means in one case, the middle uh, stent holder is in the back and in the other, it's in the front, but it looks identical. So to exclude a complete misalignment, you need also to use the REO view. That's the cusp overlap view. Otherwise, you might have a mistake. We developed, and a couple of others too, uh, a couple of years ago, the easiest way to achieve this. Uh, it has been shown uh, that uh, the valve insertion uh, with the handle should be down around 6 o'clock. That means with the flush port down, that gives a good chance of a rather good alignment from the beginning. But what we do is that we have the CT angles calculated per patient. So this is a patient-specific uh, alignment. It, it's not just a best guess as with some other valves. Uh, then when we come um, uh, close, then we, we say here, advance the marker to the top of the pigtail. So you can actually advance the nose cone of the liver system into the aortic valve itself of the native valve. And you, typically you don't see a problem with the blood pressure. So you can stay there and do this procedure in about a minute. And then you check if you're misaligned or aligned in the cusp overlap view just to exclude a mistake. And then you can go to the achievement portion, the step two, which is then the fine tuning to have two wings visible. Of, I said there are three, so the third wing is then uh, either in front or in the back and it, it's overlapping with the wire. And then a little higher, you see three uh, stand posts in a one, one, one configuration, as uh, we say. And there are actually rules of thumb, uh, how to ro rotate to have the shortest possible rotation, also to have the quickest way to achieve. If you rotate the wrong way around, it will still work, but it takes a longer time. Then you relax the handle, push down a centimeter, and deploy just the normal way. So it's actually not that complicated and takes, I would say, about a minute nowadays to do this. We recently published our initial experience of uh, uh, patients here. And uh, you see here, we measured the time. At that time, that is an, an initial cohort of 170 consecutive patients. It took us about two minutes now, I would say it's quicker. And you see the success rate is rather high with a moderate or severe misalignment in just 3% of the patients. So I think this is clearly achievable and it works also if you have torches, arteries, etc. So coming back to the case, it's a bicuspid type 1, I'd say, with an analyst of 25.4. We have coronary disease, kidney disease. The plan is to use the TAVI, accurate NEO2, large size, predilate 24, possibly post dilate with 24 to 25. And the goals, of course, to have optimal gradients, minimal PVL, no conduction issues, and preserve corner access. And the three operators you will see in the video in a couple of minutes is me, and then it's my colleague Nafsan Saleh and Chris Midori. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. So, Joanna, 83-year-old, um, bicuspid, is this a typical accurate NEO2 case in your hospital? Perhaps not a typical case, 83-year-old certainly. Um, bicuspid, I think they tend to be slightly younger. So we've done some bicuspids that are younger than this. Um, but yeah, nothing that I would shy from. I think the calcium here is moderate uh, and distributed maybe a little bit at 6 o'clock. But I think it would be still an appropriate case. 
Okay, I think um, uh, you mentioned, Andreas, that, that bicuspid maybe isn't an indication for this valve. As far as I understand, it is. Um, uh, so you can use this, this, this valve on label for a bicuspid. Um, Andreas mentioned to us, Helga, that we need to have in this rather large patient um, uh, an RFSA of 1.7. And you presented some data yesterday um, giving some accurate NEO2 information out to about five years. At one year with the ECHO, you, you got 1.8 mm -hmm. on average. Um, how did that translate to five-year outcomes with this device? I think it's pretty clear that it is important to have a uh, as large as possible effective orifice area. And, and uh, the 1.8 you were just mentioning were over all patients, so also patients with um, small uh, anatomy. Therefore, uh, for anat anatomy, which we have here, it's probably even more. So I would not expect to have any um, sort of, of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. And uh, the lower the gradient, Probably, most probably, we do not have the, the evidence yet. But mo most probably, the lower the gradient, the longer the life expectancy of both patient and valve. Okay. Um, we've got one eye in the future, right? And so we want to make sure we've got good commissural alignment. Andreas shows us he can do that in 95% of patients. We want to make sure that we've got no PVL. This valve seems to do it. Um, but to achieve that with this system, we've got to do a good pre-dilatation. How do you, in whom do you do a pre-dilatation? And in whom do you not take this valve? There are suggestions that very eccentric or very severe calcium, that this valve is not the best system on the market. What are I your think, thoughts? Uh, I have two different thoughts. One is when we talk generalistically about populations, it's a general question. Would you go with, uh, in, in this case, with, uh, you know, this valve in case of bicuspid valve? So actually, it might be the first valve. But actually, we, when we have a bicuspid valve, the valve orientation is not as simple like the, tri uh, the, the valve that is tricuspid. Because actually, the coronary orientation might be different. So this is something that the pre-procedural planning is very important to do. So you need to understand if it is... You might have a left dominancy, many, many situations that are exceptions for bicuspid, not for this. So maybe for, looking you know. at coronary alignment rather yes, than commissural you know, yes, alignment. Okay. Exactly. But actually, also when you have severe cuts, my general rules is that when the gradient is very high, I would go for pre-dilatation. Actually, in this bicuspid, you might go also with an injection to see, you know, the behavior with the coronary and things like that. But actually, it's not a contraindication to go with this, but just because you have a calcification. How do you choose the, the balloon? size? Do you go mean diameter? Yes, Do you here, go here for me there is a missing data that we'll see during the case because for me what is important is to know the virtual buzzer ring but for me it's important to know also the virtual raffi ring because if the raffi is very restrictive and you have a raffi dominant and not an annular dominant, actually I will select the balloon based on that because it depends on where you want to anchor the valve. If the, at the level of the raffi the mean diameter was 25 in this case but if at the level of the raffi is 21 actually you cannot go with a 23 balloon because you cannot tear the so the you, you you respect so, yes, the anatomy yes that is the point okay um joanna um many people when we started using this device used to rapid pace during deployment is this something that you do in your institution no, uh, we rapid pace, but the balloon dilation, and then uh, when we place the valve, sometimes we do it at 100 uh, beats per minute, but uh, usually you have a very nice stable position with this valve, and you can take your time, and um, yeah, it's not needed. Okay. Andreas, it sounds like you have some experience in this with, with this device in bicuspid, and, and we're about to start a registry together on that. Yeah. Um, what, what is what, what kind of um, what kind of how many bicuspid patients would would you have treated, and, and what's your general? Do you have any tips and tricks for us in, in in terms of treating these patients that are different to what you do in a tricuspid patient? Uh, first, I'd say we treated between fifty and one hundred patients bicuspid. Of course, there's shades of bicuspid which are um, Worse, uh, they have longer rafe uh, or more calcified rafe uh, or more excessive or not excessive calcification. Our current view is that the really severe rafe uh, with a length of more than eight to nine millimeter, it might be tough to get a good expansion of the valve. So these probably are not the best cases here. On the other hand, uh, talking about respecting the anatomy, you will see in this case, we don't really respect anatomy in that sense. We, we think we need to predilate these patients and we, without hesitation, predilate a 25 annulus in a bicuspid with a 24 valve. Uh, I'd also say if you, the dominating uh, technology on the market, the balloon expandable there, I mean, obviously you take a bigger balloon than the annulus and it seems to work too, doesn't it? So, yeah. 
think it makes this more aggressive blonde dilation makes your procedure easier later and you don't have to post dilate, which is an advantage. Particularly with heavy calcium. Helga, any questions from the audience or? Not at the moment. You guys are, uh, you guys are keeping quiet. Yeah. <laughs> to warm up. <laughs> so why don't we go and see how Andreas and the team did the case and, uh, and we can come back okay, and uh, talk to afterwards. Okay, welcome to Hospital. We have a recorded case uh, today with a bicuspid anatomy where we'll use the Boston Accurate Neo 2 valve in the large size. We have already put in the access in the right femoral and we have a secondary access for a pigtail in the left radial. I'm Andreas Rick. With me is Chris Maduri and Nafsal Saleh as operators. We have our excellent nursing team, the anesthesia team, e echo technician uh, in the room as well. So, <coughs> the, great. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you, Andreas. So, uh, as you're well aware, for accurate valves, we think it's critically important that we need to facilitate expansion by doing an effective predilation. So, in this case, this is a 25-4 annulus. It's bicuspid. So, we're going to predilate with a 24 true balloon. Yes. Balloon ready? Yeah. Pacing on, please. Pace on. Balloon up. Balloon down. Pace off. Good. Good. Here, you'll see we have the flush port down, which represents being at six o'clock. And if you just wait one second, I'm gonna take us to our traditional start of the three cusp view. And what you're gonna see next is our commissure alignment technique. So um, what we'll do here is we go around the arch here an accurate really is as flexible of a system that exists right now. So we often actually don't look at the arch as much when crossing uh, because it really just tracks right along uh, the wire quite effectively. Now, when we get to the alignment technique, there are a couple key components that I think are often missed. So first, we're gonna go to our right left view. I'll just um, uh, adjust the pigtail also. So. Let the contrast. Ah, it's a right cusp, not the non. There you go. There you go. Perfect. That's a big difference. Yeah. So you can see that difference is really a big deal there because what you'll see as we advance forward here is there will be further rotation of the valve. And so through trial and error, we recognize that needs to be at the top of the pigtail. Now here is actually really, I think, a good learning point. What you don't see is a wing very easily. But what you can alternatively see is that the stent post is sitting actually independent on the upper image there on the inner curve. So this looks like it likely is aligned in the right direction. Uh, and what we'll do now is then go to the three cusp view uh, to actually optimize the orientation afterwards. So in the now. three cusp view here, you see that we actually have Double one point. stent post on the outer curve and two on the inner curve. And so what we want to do now is because there's two on the inner curve, we're going to counterclock, which is the majority of time is a counterclock yeah, rotation. Know. So if you look at Andreas's hands here, you're going to see him gently counterclock. It is not an aggressive rotation. Uh, it usually takes about 180 degrees or so to start translating. But after that, it starts translating quite effectively and we'll uh, rotate until we see symmetry of our wing. So we're getting closer, but you still don't almost. see the wing on the inner, just on the outer. Now, I think we're getting closer there. Andreas will sit here again in a second. And now what That's we it. see is that the valve looks symmetric. Now these aren't quite as robust of wings as classically seen, but if we go back now to our uh, right left view, we'll just do a confirmation. We don't always do this, but we'll do this for the sake of today's case. You can see now still, you've truly isolated that one stent post, but you now see that wing coming out on the inner curve. So this means on here, this view, we know we're not misaligned we're within 30 degrees. And then what we did in the three cusp view is optimize ourselves for a more around zero degree misalignment. So now what we do is we always implant in the three cusp view. So we'll go to the three cusp view now and advance the device down to the level of the annulus on, with the marker at the bottom of the pigtail. Mm -hmm. Around our contrast, please. Seems good Looks to me. Looks like a good starting right. depth. Yeah. So now Nafsad is going to rotate up. one. He's going to rotate it partially until we see that the upper crowns are exposed. There we go. Yeah. So the upper crowns are now exposed. Contrast again. We look like we're a good height. As you can see, Andreas is probably going to just push in a little bit, and you can see the bend of the catheter now that it's moving, and you can see it pushing towards the outer curve. With this device, you always want to have out, uh, a forward push at the time of deployment. Now, Assad is now completing one, so now we have the stabilizing that's arch is actually opening up. Contrast so that's going to stabilize us as yep. we get ready for deployment, and we're happy with the height. Now, Andreas has actually administered some even more forward push, as you can see with the way that catheter is actually pushing towards the outer curve. Oh, now, Assad pulled the pin, and it's a rapid release 
Yeah, two. Okay. Number two, please. Yeah, perfect. Now, at this point, it's looking like we're probably about 15 degrees off in orientation, uh, but we'll get a better look at that in a second here as well. The expansion looks quite favorable. Expansion does look favorable, yeah. But, I like the expansion. Um, uh, Chris will tell us in a moment that it's important to look in the other view as well. For exactly. Expansion. So that's a great point, Andrea. So what we typically do just to kind of get our minds prepared is before we go into Echo, we usually swing to the right left. And that actually kind of gives us a heads up, do we look like we're uh, appropriately expanded or not? And actually, if you see in this angle here, it's actually pretty well expanded in the right left too. So my suspicion is, unless we see a lot of PVL, which is unlikely in this case, we're probably effectively expanded. We'll, maybe we'll not have to post dilate. So we'll put our EMA catheter in now, and then um, we will then go live on echo to evaluate uh, the need for um, post, -dilatation. post dilation or not. Yeah. And we tend to be quite generous with post dilatation if there's any doubt that uh, we ha would have a benefit of post dilatation either for gradient or for uh, uh, PVL, then we'll post yeah. dilate. Now we have only a coronary 5 French catheter across, which we feel maybe induces less uh, okay. leak. Uh, now we can go ahead on echo. So now we can go to echo. So Same the mean uh, gradient on a 3. Yeah, yeah, mean gradient of three, so clearly no reason there, although we're probably underestimated, but still if we think it's a double, it's still yeah. only six. Yeah. Maybe so we can we do didn't autography. see uh, any PVL on the echo. We also so. know sometimes we, we don't see it, uh, although there is something. So we'll put down the pigtail a little closer to the prosthesis and do an injection. Mm. There is some lag between the picture be and the sound here, but... Yeah. You see on the yeah. first beat a little bit of leak, but we saw nothing on echo. I think it's too much extra systole, I think, on that, and that's why it's coming there. Yeah, Yeah. what do you think? Should we hit it or should we leave it? It's... Uh, For me, it looks good from echo and really from the other steps. So... Uh, it's hard to on the I'm first beat. Kind of hit it, leaving it that... It's probably a mild PVL right now. Right. I mean, you can leave it. Uh, uh, it's twenty-five point four, twenty-four, four. Should do it? Uh, that kind of do it. I think. I don't yeah. know. What do you think? Yeah. Or should we upgrade to a twenty-five? No, I think it does. It's a twenty-five four ml, so we sh it's safe to use a twenty-five as well. Okay. Why not? Okay. Twenty-five balloon, please. Uh, yeah. Are we ready, ready to pace? Yes. Okay. Pacing on, please. Pacing. Yes. Balloon up. Balloon down, pace off. Okay. All right. right. And no leak. Perfect now. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes. From good to perfect. Yeah. Or it was just oh, that three. we took out the wire. We don't, or the okay. uh, but but we don't really see that so. much little leak now. With no. the email, we really don't see anything. We see dry shots all the time with the email. So, yeah. um, you know, I think as an example that right now where these technologies are going, you have to kind of, you know, in a safe fashion That's pursue thing. perfection. And this is, I think, a good example of not leaving mild behind, but going for trace to zero and leaving the patient with an optimal result. I think we'll go back to number one, uh, the uh, three cusp, just to, uh, sometimes you get a slight difference here when you post dilate that they actually twist the valve, yeah. which seems to have happened here too, actually. Yeah. That seems so it's probably constrained by calcium uh, on the bicuspid side, and then when we open it up more, it actually opens up a bit asymmetric. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so okay. about uh, 25 degrees off, probably. Okay, so apologies about some slight technical issues with the sound there, but ultimately, um, I think we finally saw what we expect to see with this valve, which is zero PVL, right? Good gradients. Tell us on the on the post implant echo, Andreas. You were looking for that effective orifice area of 1.7. What what did you get? Um, I don't have the numbers, but the, it was over two square centimeters. I think something like 2.2, okay. which is so typically if you post dilate this valve, you end up with a gradient. We know in the studies the mean gradient uh, is seven or eight, and if you post dilate, actually these patients are lower, like three to five mean gradients, which is really low. Okay, and is it what proportion of your patients would you end up post dilating, given the fact that you still pre dilate most patients, like most of us? So as we can discuss it in a minute, but as you notice in this case, we are quite liberal with post dilatation because we try to perfect the result as much as possible, and we don't seem to be punished by more pacemakers. And that means we post dilate at least half of the patients. But I must admit, on a quite weak weak indication, but I think it improves the results still. 
Okay. Joanna, um, Andreas and his team were using a true balloon for pre and post dilatation there. Is that an important element with this valve or can you use any balloon you want? Uh, no, I think with extreme calcifications, I mean, it's a fairly aggressive balloon, so we actually don't use it and still get fairly good results, I think. And we're a little bit, I mean, I think I was satisfied with your results. Sometimes you have to wait a little bit for the skirt to do the job and then light nail to expand to see no PVL. Uh, but your diastolic pressure was also above 70, so I probably, in my own practice, wouldn't have post-dilated. Hey. Giuseppe, would you have been happy with, with the result before post-dilatation in that 83-year-old? Would you have left it, or do you think, look, we should be chasing a perfect result and, 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 and post dil Actually, when we had, I was, how much was the first gradient? 10, 8? Three. 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 So you went for post dil just for the slide for today. You no, 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 for, for the day. post dilatation. <laughs> no, you but know, it was a great one. I don't I understand the reason why <laughs> you went for post dilatation. No, I'm joking. But actually, in my mm. practice, uh, you know, for this very old patient, actually, I don't want to go when I have a grain that is less than 10, actually. I won't go for further post dilatation because actually, you know, the more post dilatation you do, also the risk of stroke increase. So actually, I don't want to manipulate. I know that, Elke, probably you're not with me, but nope. actually, <laughs> the less you manipulate, <laughs> the less you manipulate, for sure, you cannot complicate the things. But why? So tell me, Elke, to be real, why do we need the reason impelling mm -hmm. evidence that we need to post dilate? The, the problem On top is, of the yeah. facts that we have to present the case. Uh, so so <laughs> we, we, we are dealing with two, uh, two different issues. So one, you're totally right, the more you interact with the valve, uh, the higher the risk that something happens. On the other hand is um, you want to, to really yield a perfect result without any PVL. And um, today we do not really know what is more important to have this PVL of zero or to and, and take this small additional risk with the post dilatation or to accept it like it is. On the other hand, um, all the data we have, it's all retrospective data, of course, um, does not show any evidence that post dilatation is increased, uh, it does increase uh, the stroke rate. And therefore, I would definitely go the same way as Andreas did it and try to, to avoid any form of PVL. And uh, this um, um, Life in a Box case nicely showed what you can achieve with a single uh, balloon um, inflation. Yeah, Giuseppe, I'm afraid I'm going to gang up on you as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I mean, I what, what, what we saw after your implant is not usual for this valve. We don't see that type of leak with this valve in the vast majority of situations, right? And so if we don't get a good result, I think you chase a good result. This is not like um, other self-expanding valves where the valve is high and you have a risk of pop-up. With this valve, the risk of pop-up, if you implant it at five to seven millimeters, is very low. So, so really, I think there's no, as long as you respect the anatomy, you took the same balloon size as you did before and or maybe one, one millimeter more. One millimeter more even. Um, which but as long as you're discussed. respecting the yeah. anatomy, I think that I don't really see a cost for it. Uh, and ultimately, I think we saw a nice result. I think one point which is important um, to, to uh, tell is um, that we should not use a balloon which is too large because uh, the leaflets are without any cage. So they, they can easily be damaged if you take a too large balloon and probably this was the reason why you used uh, the, the true um, balloon as a non-compliant balloon. Actually, it's not just a matter of the size, also the positioning, because you need to stay below the commissure. Because if you stay with a balloon that is a little bit larger and uh, above the commissure, actually you may have the risk to tear the leaflets. So actually the position also, the post dilatation, I think, is important. Yes. So for the large, actually, 26 millimeter is the maximum that's allowed for large size valve. This was a 25, so it should still be safe, I guess. Yeah. Joanna, um, we had the opportunity through Boston Scientific to actually um, uh, do a post-implant CT and 3D print the result. Can you, can you show us what we got? And, and when we talk about op, you know, the option of future coronary access, when we talk about the option of future TAV and TAV, can, can you tell us really, show us what we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So this was a, a real patient. Um, just one moment, Joanna, just while we get... Yeah, we go. No Thank problem. you. So this is a real patient that was implanted with the accurate uh, NEO. Um, and you can see on the first slide um, that, um, and that it was 3D, 3D printed based on a CT scan um, in Galway. 
um, you can see that the coronary access is really easy with this. You can do it internally, but also externally behind because you have quite a bit of space. Um, you can see this here, that right coronary access and left coronary access would be very easy in this um, situation. Let me just see. Uh, the screen is not really reacting to move the slides forward again. Perfect. Now I have it. <laughs> Technical difficulties again. Um, yeah, so this shows you here again in 3D. You can see almost uh, maybe 15% uh, misalignment, um, but still the catheters uh, reach the ostia very nicely. And then if you have a valvular degeneration, which we might get if we start doing 65-year-old patients uh, 15 years later, um, then you see here a 3D printer simulated implantation of the Edwards um, or balloon expandable valve and valve within the accurate. And you see that the leaflets are not going to come up higher than the crown. So if your initial implantation was good, you will not get an obstruction of the coronary. So it's safety for your second procedure. And still, again, you have very good access to, the bo to both of the coronaries. So if the patient uh, has an MI, has chest pain, uh, you will not be struggling. Um, and this is, again, um, the same uh, in sort of 3D. Uh, you can see that you can go internally, but also externally behind here and access your left coronary. So fairly easy. So Joanna, this is post-sapien implant, right? Um, it's implanted low. We know that in, in these patients or, or with this system, the, the leaflets actually come up to the, to the mid post. And so there is, as we can see, a degree of leaflet overlap here. But you can see is that even with that leaflet overlap, there's still really no obstruction to flow. So even if um, with the accurate Neo, it comes above your coronary, the post, still you have this space between um, the upper crown uh, and the leaflet post, you have this space here that you can get a catheter. And also your leaflets will never be out here on the edge of the aorta. They will always be constrained within these posts. And so really this system gives us good coronary access and good coronary access even after TAV and TAV. Helga, you had a question from the audience. Exactly. Um, to the um, issue you just mentioned, is there any impact of leaflet overhang in uh, Tavin Tavi? So if you put a sapien um, into an accurate? Actually, this is a very important point. Um, so the point is that you, you will have the leaflets overhanging when you go for a deep implantation. That means that you target the sapien in an outflow to outflow level. At that point, you will have, based on the Previous comment actually considered that the, the leaflets is attached at the mid portion of the commissure. You will have leaflets overhanging. Nobody knows. Actually, you won't have any gradient with the leaflets overhanging. The question mark stay on the fact that you might have some kind of impaired diastolic feeling that I haven't seen so far in real clinical practice. On the bench, sometimes there is this kind of description, but I've done many reinterventions for previous generation accurate. And actually going with the sapien, with, you know, there were mainly insufficiencies, so I went down deep in the implantation with, you know, an overhanging of about 40%. I didn't see any impairment in the solid feeling, and I have zero gradient, and the patients stay very well. So this is the general comments I can do so far. So I think we're, we're just coming up to time. Um, I'd like to thank Boston Scientific for sponsoring the session. Thank uh, our, our distinguished panel. Um, I think we've learned that the Accurate Neo2 is a good index valve, that we, we get good hemodynamic results. We get very little PVL. And in the case that we saw from Andreas and his team, they did not accept mild PVL. Uh, and a simple post-dilatation resolved uh, the PVL to zero. We've seen from the 3D print that not only is Accurate a good, a good choice in terms of the index valve, Valve, but it also allows us future TAV and TAV options and future coronary access because we can commissurally align this valve. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for, for coming to this uh, symposium. Thank you for your participation and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting.